Well, good afternoon. If you are in New York City or Maine, Damariscotta, Maine, I think is the name of the place. Good evening, Buonasera. If you are in Rome, Italy, uh, greetings to people all over the world who follow Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Adagio, the place where classical music happens. As you know, Adagio is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to fans all around the world. My guest today is a very fine singer, an American who has lived in Europe for many, many years, makes her career there, makes her life there, and someone I like a lot for her work, someone I've liked for her persona, but we don't know each other. So, no, never met, actually. Not at all. We've never met, and uh, we've crossed paths enough. We just have never met. Um, Kate Aldrich is a wonderful mezzo-soprano. Kate, when I refer to something called Planet Opera, what I mean is those of us who work in opera and know of each other, but we don't necessarily cross paths. And listeners, this is my asthma. Um, So as much as listeners, I'd like to get to know Kate Aldrich. And I'm going to start with Damariscotta, Maine. Am I pronouncing it correctly? Well, already I have to correct you. Go ahead. (laughs) It's Damariscotta. Damariscotta. Yeah, it sounds like a fruit to me. I know it's not. It's actually a a Native American word, and it means Mm -hmm. a river of fishes. What are the fishes? River of fishes. River of fishes. I love that. And is there a river there? Yeah, there's a great river. We have we have excellent oysters. I can imagine. Yeah. Talk about. I mean, Maine is a paradise for Americans who know better. It's not everybody's idea of paradise. It's my idea of paradise. It's incredibly beautiful. It's kind of wild, but has gorgeous coastline and beautiful interior and rough weather, but fantastic food products, lobsters, berries, potatoes, excuse me, apples, uh, Mainers, as they're called, at least historically, very much are free thinking, independent um, go their own way. Sometimes they don't say very much. Is the yeah. stereotype true? Kind of. I mean, I think the stereotype of being a few words is true um, for most people, but I also think they're very creative thinkers um, and generally very creative people. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of uh, musicians and artists that have come out of actually Damascata over the years. Um but yeah, it's it's a very it's a wild place. It is um, not an, necessarily an easy place to live, but it gave so much space for creativity growing up because we don't have you know the movie theater showing cinema all day long. Um, we don't we can't go to the theater. We can't go uh, to see opera so much. So we kind of invent our own fun and create um, our own. But it is famous for Summer Stock Theater. Um, mm-hmm. A woman who was my assistant for a number of years is now the, I should know her title, I believe it's production manager or technical director of the Ogonquin Playhouse. Oh. A very old historic playhouse theater in Maine. Um, I have another friend, colleague who works in opera who summers in Maine on an island that I think it's called Monhegan, where there's no yeah. electricity. Monhegan has electricity, but it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's that's another, really close to where I grew up. Okay, there's another island then that he goes to that does not have electricity. Yeah. And they seem to prefer it that way. It's wonderful. My Actually, my best friend's family has an island, which is a pretty normal thing in Maine, that people have family islands. And there is no electricity. They have solar panels now, but um, no running water. And it's wonderful. Really go off the grid. Yeah. Yeah, um, I've had that experience in Finland where I was on an island in the Gulf of Finland in yeah. July and it was idyllic, but there was no water. I mean, we had to get water out of the Gulf and boil it. We had to yeah. capture our own <laughs> fish, pick mushrooms, yeah. and outhouse, but it was glorious. No, it's amazing. Using We use the rainwater for the wash water, but 
to keep, and then the mosquitoes lay their larvae in the wash water. So to keep the mosquito larva down, you put goldfish in the rainwater. Wow. Like this. And then, you know, obviously we have to boil the water to, to use it, but. Sure. Yeah. Um, so where did music enter for you? Oh, the million dollar question. I, I think it was always, we were a very musical family, but um, it wasn't anything that was pushed. It was just something that I, I think we all were very interested in music. My grandmother was a pianist. Um, my parents both sang in the church choir, you know, the typical. Um, and then I played French horn. So my first instrument was actually playing the French horn and I was mm -hmm. pretty good at it. And I was very promising, um, but it was never it didn't do the same thing for me as voice did. So singing kind of came in, um, you know, I always sang in like the school play when I was a child, but the singing came in later, um, <clears throat> probably in the high school, but it was primarily in like a rock band. Uh, so that was evolved eventually when I decided to go to college. And, but yeah, I don't know. I think it was just um, growing up listening to ABBA albums and, trying mm -hmm. to figure out the meter because there were a lot of meter shifts and I thought that mm -hmm. was really interesting. So it's kind of nerding out already as a kid about it. Um, I've never asked an opera singer this, but you, Juan Diego Flores, Renee Fleming, a number of singers sang either rock or jazz or both uh, Michael Mays, the baritone. There are a few Rock singing is usually done with microphones, but even at that, it's done at rather high volume mm -hmm. in a way that if you don't manage your voice properly, can really wreck the voice. Yeah. The, the whole art of singing opera and leader and art song and recitals is very different physically for a singer than is singing rock and roll. Absolutely. How did you start singing rock and roll? How did you know what to do? And how did you unlearn that to then become an opera singer? Well, I don't think I ever unlearned it. I think I applied what I had, you know, sourced from myself to do that kind of music. And I just shifted it into classical training. Um, yeah, I, I just, I listened to, I mean, I, I listened to singers that actually were terrible for vocal technique, like Janis Joplin and... Mm -hmm. And um, I was really interested in that style of music, but I think, uh, yeah, I just, I think I like the freedom of it. But then when I discovered, really discovered opera, I actually found that opera was even more freeing. It potentially once, you know, when your technique is working for you, you can do anything. I mean, you, you're you flying over the orchestra. It's, it's incredible. So, and I think also the fact that I am a mezzo-soprano and I'm not afraid of chest voice, maybe has something to do with uh, this rock training. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, we're in a political season in the United States. And yeah. one word that's used a lot is freedom. And uh -huh. so I've been trying to understand for myself, what do we mean by freedom? And yesterday I just wrote on an index card, freedom does not mean anarchy. And right. so I'm focusing on that because... I fully hear you on what you're saying about freedom to sing and freedom to how to sing. Yeah. But within there, there must be something. Janis Joplin, who I actually heard when I was about 12 years old, really? um, was an extraordinary singer because she connected to the music and the lyric and everything that great singers do, whatever, whatever the form of music. But, she died at 27. I don't know if yeah. she could have kept singing that way. No. Tina Turner sang for a very long time, and it was rather remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, she was described as an alto. I never quite knew what voice to describe her as, but right. as an alto. Um, but she had this phenomenal force and energy, and she danced too. Mm -hmm. But um, upper singers... and excuse me, and certainly mezzo-sopranos, if they manage their voices right, can have a very long run as a career. Yeah, absolutely. And that's not necessarily something that opera singers, I mean, that rock singers have. Yeah. Um, because they have the luxury, let's call it, but also the crutch of a microphone. Exactly. And therefore, the artistry, I'll use that word, the artistry is different from yeah. the artistry 
in rock and roll and jazz and so on. There's definitely the microphone is definitely part of the production of their their whole presentation. Yeah. Whereas I think as a classical singer, what is freeing is when everything is lined up and the technique is lined up and you have a great orchestra, a great conductor, you're prepared. Um, you have ideas about what you want to say, um, mm -hmm. about your character, about the words, about the the deeper meaning, um, the metaphors. Uh, that Those are the parameters that enable you to then have freedom. So like you were saying, that's a really good point, that it's not anarchy. That's... Uh, that's that agrees with that argument and needless to say something that you and i take for granted but i want to mention it to our listeners is that you are playing a character you're playing a role mm -hmm. in opera it's different if you're doing a recital where you are singing a song a song group and perhaps expressing phenomena or emotions in the songs that are embedded in the three or four minute songs but it's not the same as being Carmen or Adalgisa for three hours. Not exactly, but I, I don't know if this is the right thing, but I tend to dive into a character even with song. Mm -hmm. And so I, I sort of, it's like a cloak. It's me telling the story, but it's me in this other mask in a way. Nancy, I, if you would, kind of a song... Necessary. A mm -hmm. song group or composer or cycle or individual song. That's an example of what you're talking about. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, I would do, even if it was a group of songs that have different composers that were not meant to go together, but they have a theme in common, which sometimes is done. I'll try to find for myself, just for me, a through line and um, a character that has the development through that cycle um when you program a recital I'm, i mean again i know this stuff well but i don't ask singers very often how do you structure a, reci <coughs> a recital that you're creating let's say to tour in italy oh i don't know i mean as opposed I'm not, to bringing to, say, to the united states i am not the most uh recitally kind of singer I do much more opera and symphonic. Um, but yeah, I think I would probably, I don't know, look at things that I have done, some things that I have done, some things that are new, and mm -hmm. something usually kind of a risk. What constitutes a risk? Um, something that I've never done before that I've always wanted to do, but I never thought I could do. Um, or or something that seems emotionally uh, overwhelming. Like um, mm -hmm. I did, the, you know, this um, masterclass by Jake Heggie, the piece yes. for masterclass. Yes. Piece, phenomenal. And it's just so moving. And it's so much about what we do. Mm -hmm. That was that was an example of one of those things, I think. So I, as an admirer of your work and of the mezzo-soprano voice in general, happens to be a real favorite of mine, oh, yeah. um, would always try to think of the artist I'm facing and ask her, would she consider the following music? And sometimes I'm completely off the mark. And mm -hmm. sometimes a singer may say, well, I've never thought of that, but that's a good one. And sometimes she'll politely say, no, that Nothing. doesn't work. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of Hector Berlioz. Huge so fan of Hector uh, Berlioz. Huge. And you are either a Berliozian or you're not. Yes. It's a strange it. thing. He's the only composer I refer to by his first name. I refer to Hector because to me, I feel that close to him and his work and so on. And one of my favorite works by Hector that I think you could do magnificently is The Death of Cleopatra. Have you ever looked at it? Time. Yes. And I've performed it and I'm doing it in two months. Okay, <laughs> I didn't know. Where are you doing it? Yeah, I'm doing it in um, Genova. I did it before in Salzburg. Okay, so now that we're talking about Genova, I did a little research, a little, about mm -hmm. who you're married to. Yes. And his name is Riccardo Minazzi. Yeah. And he's a conductor and a violinist. Yes. 
Okay. And he conducts a lot in Genova. And because you and I are just beginning to talk, you okay. don't know that I have lived in the province of Genova for a very, very long time. Really? Um, in yeah. a little town in the province. I'm not going to mention it, but it's a town where the Luisi family lives and the okay, Shai yeah. family also lives. Oh, and okay. I didn't know that because I know Fabio Luisi. I know Ricardo Shai just a little bit. But um, Shai's parents live there. And there are other music people there, but it's a town where people remain very private so that I never knew. But um, it is 23 kilometers from Genoa okay. and you can take the train in. And Genoa has the fantastic Tetra Carlo Felice. Mm -hmm. And um, you will be singing Berlioz's Death of Cleopatra there. Who's conducting? Ricardo. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So now that we know that you're married to a conductor and mm -hmm. there are many cases of singers and conductors being married or in relationships, um, how do you develop with the conductor a particular performance? In Not general? Not because you're married. Not because okay. you're married, but because you're close. That's what, really what yeah, I mean. Yeah, close yeah. enough to, yeah. Well, um, I think in general, he he in particular works a lot with detail of the score in exactly as written. So if it's written pianissimo, we try to do an actual pianissimo. Um, and this is the way I also like to work. So this is not just isolated with him, but it's a pleasure to be able to work with someone who also enjoys going into, into the smallest details and... Um, so I think, you know, we don't do a whole lot of preparation in advance, primarily because we're both like ships in the night. It's We're not always in the same place that we can prepare in advance. But um, like with La Mort de Cleopatra, we have this program. We do that and the Wesen Donc Lieder. Mm -hmm. Wagner. In the, same, in the same program. Yes. And so we yeah. did this in Salzburg already. And, and I remember um, not having worked together at all in advance. Um, but it was such a pleasure because when you know the person so well and you know sort of w what their facial expression means on a deeper level, um, yeah, it was very satisfying. It's complicated too. We also did a Carmen together once, which was which was not as easy. <laughs> Why was it not as easy? Well, no, I mean, in the end it was fine, but I think at the time I had done many, 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 many Carmens and he had not done it before. Uh -huh. And so he had a very clear ideas that I was not as comfortable with, but he ended up selling them to me. So I bought it. You are a very famous Carmen. I've seen your Carmen. I've loved your Carmen. Um, it's a role that it seems that in each generation, one or two mezzo sopranos are called the Carmen of her generation. I right. tend not to go into that kind of language because there are always new yeah. Carmen's, there's plenty of room, and I've seen many, many interpretations of the role. And I worked on a production once with Regina Resnick, who was a very famous Carmen, but yeah. by then she was directing and her husband was designing Carmen. <laughs> it was in Venice. And it's a huge role that anyone can fit into, frankly. Yeah. And I think that there are certain stereotypes that she must be beautiful. She must be fatalistic. She must be um, an anti-hero. She must be this or that. And I don't quite subscribe to that. Yeah. But would you tell me about your Carmen in terms of who she is? Yeah. Um, well, I have to preface it by saying that I, I have never nailed it down and and set it in stone what my interpretation of Carmen is. I think every show I find something new. Every production, depending on depending on the production and the stage director and the conductor, that I'll always find something new and interesting. And sometimes things that I want to hang on to, and sometimes things that I let go that are not appropriate outside of that production. Um, and then things that happen on an individual night, magical things that happen with colleagues and. Um, but that said, I think she is a very 
modern, independent, feminist woman. And she's very clear. She's not um, wishy-washy. She's not trying to seduce for the sake of seduction. She is very factual with what it is that she wants, what she's interested in, who she's interested in, and when she's not interested anymore. You know, it's very, it's very clear. And it's always, it's always so amazing to me when people come at it as, um, you know, like, oh, look what you did to him. You know, they'll say to me as the actor, mm-hmm. look what you did to Don Jose. And it's always so strange to me because I, 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 I don't see it that way at all. I see it as somebody who has a severe mental disorder murdering mm. his girlfriend. I have been preparing some lectures to give here in New York, uh, connected with some of the productions at the Met. And the Met in this winter has been doing Carmen and is yeah. working on a production of La Forza del Destino. Okay. And, and I'll be speaking for both. And so, therefore, informing my themes and my ideas and not wanting to be predictable, um, I've been grappling with the concept of the difference between fate and destiny. Mm-hmm. And because um, they're really, at least in English, not the same thing. Right. And there's a line in Carmen in the third act, the destiny la mezco. In other words, destiny rules. Destiny is the master. Yeah. Um, and yet when she plays the cards and does not come up with a good set of cards, um, I'm I'm trying to sort out, and I don't have an idea yet really, is she fatalistic? Does she accept her fate? Um, yeah. I think she, just... she knows. I think it's all clear in the cards. I think it starts in act two with Don Jose when he's singing the aria and he says, um, Pourquoi, um, why did why did fate put you in my path? And then she realizes at that moment, fate did put me in your path. And I know why. The reason is because we need you to go into the mountains. And we're meant to be, it's not necessarily because she's thinking we're meant to be in love forever. She's thinking, this is why I'm going to sing La Balaba mm-hmm. down in the mountains. You're going to come with me. And so for her, it's, and I think she is interested in him. I I, I don't think it's as simple as just a, a negotiation, you know, but I think by the time she gets to act three, um, you know, they're, they're fighting, they're bickering. He's driving her crazy. She doesn't want to be with him anymore. And then she doles out the cards and sees, and sees that in fact, this is all meant to be that this is, this is how it's going to end. And so when he comes in, she knows, okay, this is, this is it. I think she still fights for her life, but she knows. There are so many stagings I've seen of the last act. Yeah. Um, You know, there are certain acts in opera, like act two of Tosca, act four of Carmen, where we know the lines, we know the, the movements and gestures that usually go with the lines and the music, and sometimes stage directors adhere to that, to the, quote, tradition. Others rebel against it and try to create something new. Yeah. Uh, I have seen Carmen's practically be suicidal, where they plunge yeah. themselves into the knife. Um, others where they practically attack him um, physically. Others where they fight for their life. Others where they consent because fate or destiny has determined that she will die at that moment. Um, Do you, in the last act, in the music as written, because you were talking about how you and your husband, Ricardo Minazzi, try to follow things as written. um, Do you, what approach do you take to the staging of that, those last few minutes? Um, She is afraid but she is brave and when she's when he starts getting violent with her she knows the end is coming um but he's not doing it and so she's kind of getting to a point where she's almost like come on you know and that's why at the certain point she is so so frustrated that she's finally just like 
That's you remember the string? Remember the string? Is this me? Oh, sorry. That's Ricardo. Okay. Remember this ring and take it. I don't want it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And then he, that's too much for him. He gets all like he's ready. She can see that this is it, that he's going to do something even bigger than before. And I think at that point, she's almost provoking him like, so what? Are you going to do it or what? You know, are you afraid? Are you too afraid? And so she's almost uh, forcing him to man up about it in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, she almost walks into it in a sense, but I don't think it's uh, by any means her doing it. In studying Carmen, the opera again, as if for the first time right now for my lectures coming up, um, I'm trying to get a new take on the relationship between Carmen and Michaela, mm. because they're often depicted as the opposites. Yeah, antagonists. As, you know, the the Venus and, and the Elizabeth, or, you know, the, what's her name in Faust? Marguerite where there's the virgin, the good one, and quote, the bad one. And yeah. I don't subscribe to that. But no. um, not at all. I think that Michaela has her purpose and her belief system, but I also think she's more worldly than she's given credit for. Yeah, she and goes I've in alone. Yeah, I've seen productions where there's almost a bond between, a sisterly bond between Carmen and Michaela. I think I think Carmen has a lot of respect towards Michaela. I think she sees her as like, yeah, this woman is in love with this man, so she's going after the man she loves. That's what she should do. Mm -hmm. She's a strong woman. And I think also Michaela sees in the end of Act Three, when you know Don Jose has beaten Carmen down, you know, for making fun of him, or what he considers to be making a fool of him. And he's beaten her down. And Michaela sees Carmen on the floor and feels pity for her and, and sees like, what is, who is this man? And what is, you know, I think she has, they, they have a lot of mutual understanding between them, but they live on complete other planets. Yeah. One the other, so they would never interact. And bass baritones that I know who have sung Escamillo, if they have good physiques or they're handsome, like to wear the costumes, but I've never had any of them say that they find the music satisfactory. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's a funny thing. There there have been a cup, a handful, not even, maybe two or three that have said that they really enjoy the role. For the most part, I think it's like you come on, you sing the aria, which is really hard. Yeah. And it's high, it's low, there's no place to breathe. And they're supposed to be jumping around on tables and whipping the thing around and, you know, just wearing themselves thin. Um, and then th that's kind of it. Oh, and then the duet with the tenor, which is also a big, you know, active. Right. Yeah, you know, with a high note at the end. And so I think it's a lot of work for not so much payoff, maybe. Um, and I think it may be uncomfortable. It's, it's because it's high and it's low. You're going to either be uncomfortable with a high or you're going to be uncomfortable with a low. There are very few singers who... Actually, Kyle Kettleson, I think, is doing it at the Met now. And he, he was a wonderful one. That I, yes, that I he with. is. Yeah, he's but, a um, <laughs> what does Carmen think of him? What does your Carmen think of him? Is he just sort of an object of affection or briefly, or does she use him strategically for her own interest? I won't say gain because you never know with her. Yeah, I think she's I think she's interested in him. I think she's curious about him he's like a f the famous rock star that's come into town and he's taken a liking to her and that's that's thrilling um i think she also sees someone that's similar to her she's met her match essentially and i think that that was that is a love that could have been a true love i also think that the two of them in their characters flirt with death a lot as yeah. part of their of who they are, whereas Mikael and Don Jose not necessarily. No, they're well. I wouldn't say Mikael is a coward, but Don Jose is most definitely a coward. No, I'm not saying coward, but that they flirt with death, because you know if you're a bullfighter, you could die at any moment. Yeah. Harmon 
in some productions I've seen very much as a death wish, or at least she's willing to accept that she may die. Yes. Yeah. And therefore she lives in a very different way. Yes, I would agree with that. So have you ever sung a role in the opera Don Giovanni? No, I no. was I asked to sing um, Don Elvira once. Right. And I was, yeah, I was, I was a little, I, it's, it's, it really kind of sits up there. I asked because I have loved talking with singers who have sung Carmen and Elvira because Don Giovanni in many ways is the male Carmen. Right. Anti-hero is fatalistic. Do what I want. Um, yeah. Death, take me if you wish, but I have to be free, whatever freedom is and yeah. so on. And I found it particularly exciting when I've seen a Carmen sing Elvira because yeah. of the relationship of Elvira who is very clingy in a way. Yeah. She's the last woman who will who will go to bat for Don Giovanni when all the other women have given up. Right. And so but it, it's not a given that that happens, but I'm always interested. It's, it's a connection that I love looking at in opera. Yeah, it's um, probably not super common, but I can I I can imagine for the more soprano -y types of Carmen's like me essentially. And I've seen a few bass baritones sing Escamillo and Don Giovanni. Okay. Yeah. Samuel Ramey, for example. Mm -hmm. And that's always very interesting because they seem to bring something from one opera to the other. Right. A similar something. Yeah. That's interesting. So I read an interview with you and you mentioned a singer who you said you would love to have for dinner at dinner. Uh, she's no longer with us. She's a singer who I worked with extensively in many, many, many productions, Tatiana Troianos. Yeah. And for many singers of your generation, the role model that they hold up from the previous generation is Tatiana Troianos. Mm -hmm. Why? I mean, number one, I've cooked dinner for Tatiana Troianos, and it's not an easy experience. Really? <laughs> Why she is was, that? I cooked Thanksgiving for her one year, many years ago. Okay. And it was a small party of just a few opera singers who were, um, I'm not an opera singer, but I cooked, um, who were in New York but didn't have their families. Okay. In the case of Tatiana, she didn't really have a family. So okay. they invited her to this dinner and I cooked. And she knew me as performance manager of the Met. She knew me helping, working with her in, she did Eboli, she did Venus, she did Octavian, she did Kundry, she did Sesto. She was amazing in all these roles. Um, but she would go 110% into the role and the character and yeah. the music. And it was an amazing thing. And at the end of a performance, she would be completely exhausted, um, yeah. but very energized. And... But then on her nights off, she was often not focused. I mean, she was focused, but it was kind of like um, a champion racehorse who wanted to get back on the track and go. Right. And on the nights when she couldn't do it, she was very restless. Okay. Um, Iriquet, as the Italians would say. And she was a very picky eater for that reason, because all she wanted to talk about was the next performance. And many oh, of the yeah. other singers did not want to talk about the last performance or the next performance. They wanted right. to talk about their families. They wanted to talk about whatever. And they wanted to eat. And, yeah. and they wanted to eat. She really caused a distraction. That said, she was a fabulous singer and a oh. sensational actress and, and really one off, of a kind. When you were listing off all those roles, too, that I mean, that's part of what is what I what most singers love so much about her is that she sang all of the repertoire. She sang everything. Yeah. And so it's kind of fascinating to know how and, and that she weathered it so well. I mean her her voice was it, she had a long career. And yeah. then she went to doing some musicals and I mean yeah. And she, she did she Anita like, in West Side Story with Jose I know. Harris and Kiri Takano on the album that Bernstein recorded. Yeah. Yeah exactly. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, and also the way she throws herself into a role 
like you said, 110%, which is, I, I can relate to that. I kind of have that same uh, problem that I get really excited about the, the storytelling part of it. And so I have to sometimes keep myself down girl, you know, she did a Carmen that I saw that was, she was wonderful, but I forget if it was George Schulte who the conductor was, but maybe George Schulte who insisted that they do all the French spoken dialogue. Yes. I have this a, a very long evening. There's a recording, but I heard it live. With the Domingo. It a, yeah. yeah. It was a very, very, very long evening because she focused so much on interpreting the, the spoken dialogue as an actress because for listeners, they should know that the original version by Georges Bizet was done at the Opera Comique in Paris. And the Opera Comique was not the Paris Opera. It was a place where you would have musical theater that was often very dramatic or comical, but with a lot of spoken dialogue that yeah. was understandable to the local French audiences. But Bizet died very soon after the premiere. And when Carmen was presented in Vienna, it was musicalized so that we don't have the spoken dialogue very much. But um, she, Troyanos, was a scary Carmen, and I mean this in the good sense. She was a frighteningly extraordinary Santuzza in Cavalli Rusticana. I've never seen a better one. Really? Um, her Santuzza was absolutely... There's some scratchy YouTube video that you can find. Okay. Um, where she played the character as pregnant, which the character is. But um, in the Met production, the old Met production by Franco Zeffirelli, there were a lot of steps on a church in the small yeah, town in Sicily. And Troianos hurled herself down the steps as if trying to lose the pregnancy. Oh, wow. And and that wasn't part of the original production? No. <laughs> it wow. was kind of like Boris Goodenough doing his famous fall, Marty Tavla, at the end when Boris dies, he goes down a bunch of steps. It was the same thing. And Trianos was frightened, but also fearless. Yeah. Um, we have a very famous production at the Met of Tannhäuser, and in Venus in Act 3, um, has to sort of reach out for Tannhäuser one last time. And Tatiana was tall, not heavy, but strong and tall. And mm -hmm. I had to hold her as she lunged forward calling for Tannhäuser one last time before he disappears and she disappears. Um, but she would hang off the edge of this precipice and wow. you just never knew. And that was part of the excitement. But you yeah. just never quite knew what was going to happen. So like it's almost dangerous. Like it's it almost, was very it's dangerous, but precipice. it was exciting. Yeah, exactly. That's and good feeling. But it was exciting if you were an audience member. It was exciting, perhaps, if you were a colleague where you didn't have to catch her. But yeah. It was not exciting if you were the person like me who often had to be the person to prevent her from killing herself. Right. Um, but she was a fascinating figure, very private in a lot of ways. Did you ever meet her? I assume you heard her. Yes. Did you ever? Yes. Never so heard her live. Ah, okay. Yeah. So what is it about Tatiana Troyano? I should tell listeners, by the way, if memory serves, she was born in 1938. And she died in her mid-50s of cancer. She had okay. had breast cancer that was treated, but then it recurred in her liver and she died of liver cancer. Um, and But she performed almost to the end. Uh, in Capriccio with Kiri Takanawa, um, as Geschwitz in Lulu. Um, I saw her with Catherine Malfitano do Hansel and Gretel, and then oh, wow. a few years later do Lulu and Geschwitz. <laughs> Quite a growth curve in, a few, in just a few years. But talk about Troyanos, because to me, she was just one of the greatest. Yeah, I mean, I think it's her the the quality of sound, the this this sort of bubbling sound that she has that she was able to maintain it through all of the lines of singing that she did. 
I mean, like even when, when you think about her, that Carmen recording you were talking about before, or the Carmen performance you were speaking about before, in the recording in the Habanera, it's just this, you know, because you know Habanera is a difficult aria because you're going through these kind of tricky registers um, and she's just seamless the way she sort of floats through it. I think she has this sort of ethereal floating quality, but still managing to hold on to this sort of core of sound where you, it, it's like something you could bite into almost. And then of course her, 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 Throw it the way she throws herself into the character so completely. It's just, she's thrilling. She is. She was, she is. Um, you have done many of the roles that she has done. And yeah. I've seen you in some of them. Uh, I wish I could have seen you in more of them, but I've been more on this side of the Atlantic, you more on that side. But at the Met, I've seen you as Madalena, as Carmen with a guy named Jonas Kaufman, and mm -hmm. as Adalgisa with Sandra Radvanovsky mm -hmm. and Ricardo Fritza conducting. And um, I saw her Adalgisa with Renata Scalto. I saw her Carmen, as I mentioned. I never saw her as Madalena. I saw yeah. you in Prague as an absolutely fantastic sesto. Oh, you were there? La, yes, in La Clemenza oh. di Tito. And La Clemenza di Tito is my favorite Mozart opera. It's one of my favorite operas, period. Sesto, yeah. to me, is one of the greatest of all characters. Uh, Tatiana was a phenomenal Sesto in the production by Jean-Pierre Ponel because yeah. of the way she was directed. Mm -hmm. And you, I don't think you were ever directed by Ponel, but you were the no, only... I did Carmen. I did his Carmen in San Francisco, but I he was not there. No, but I mean in uh, as Sesto in La Clemenza. Yeah, no, no, I didn't. Okay, the reason I mentioned that is that you came the closest in terms of staging and spirit to the Troianos Ponel Sesto that was done at the Met. Well, that's and a comment. I, and I thought to myself, if ever I got to ask you, I would ask you, how did that occur? How did you build your Sesto? I mean, I, I definitely had seen that video, the uh, the, the performance of that on, on video. Um, but I don't remember thinking to model myself after, also because, you know, the Ponell productions are quite stylized and especially that one is very stylized. Yeah. Um, I think it may be the stage directors, um, Ursula and Carl Ernst Hermann, they were the ones who did it and, um, they also are quite stylized and I think it may just be a happenstance kind of idea. But um, I so, so, so believed in their ideas for that production and, and the character that they wanted me to create as Sesto. I, it was, so, that was a performance that was so fulfilling every time. Cause I did it many times. We did it. Um, we did many performances in that one season. And in the following season, we did some more. Um so I did a lot of performances of it. And each night it was in the middle of it. I remember during a costume change, I always had this moment of like, I am so lucky that I get to do what I do. I mean, it was just also because in that opera, you have one just beautiful scene after the next. So, yeah. And because it was written for Prague. Yes. And because it was written for Prague in that theater. That to me, what you know, it's kind of like drinking a wine at the vineyard where the grapes are grown. Yes. It's just exactly. a very different experience to see an opera in the theater for which it was intended. Yeah. For the audience for which it was intended. Absolutely. Um, it's Mozart's last opera. People always say the magic flute is. It was not. Mozart wrote the overture of the magic flute and one little choral passage for magic flute. And it was produced after La Clemenza. But in August and September of, of 1791. But to me, Mozart's last operatic statement is La Clemenza di Tito. And it's about clemency. It's about uh, reconciliation. It's about accepting hard truths that are nonetheless the reality of life. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, Titus Tito is a fascinating character because he's not, he has to give up everything, in effect, for Rome. He gives up the woman he loves for Rome. He loses his best friendship, perhaps. 
he almost loses Rome. Yeah. Um, I don't think the real Titus Vespasian was as enlightened as this one was, but Mozart right. wrote the opera for um, I, Leopold I, I think, when he was, uh, there was a coronation in 1791 in uh -huh. Prague, and it was in effect, in effect, an occasion opera. And therefore, Mozart was intending to send a message of the way Beethoven did with certain works later on, that it was a message opera, whereas the yeah. other operas were about characters, were about wonderful things. But Sesto is, he is a character who, in many ways, is the lead in the opera, even though it's the I clemency of Titus, but he's really the central figure. And he's he, the of us. Yeah. And it's his evolution from loyal friend to one who is bewitched and enchanted by the fabulous Vitalia, who is, you know, great dramatic person um, yeah. with great music, with phenomenal music and a great mad scene. Mozart could write mad scenes with the best of them. Oh, and but, that whole scene at the end of the first part is incredible. Yeah. And uh, in, effect, in effect, she's saying, guarda me, guarda me, look at me, look at me. Um, it's, it's just an amazing, amazing, I'm getting goosebumps as I talk about it. But it's an opera that even now is not done as much as it should be. Yeah. No, I agree. And there's just so many great numbers in it. And the story itself is just so fabulous. Yeah. So, um what I mean, it's interesting. I've looked over the roles that you've done, and and they include. Oh, another one that I saw you do, um, in a very unusual setting was Amneris. Oh, in in Busetto. Now that was. Did you, see it? did you see that live performance? I did. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So, how to describe this? This is Aida, in a production by Franco Zeffirelli, but not on a massive scale uh and not intended, to. not intended to be it was a pocket-sized aida production because this was in the teatro verdi in busetto um which has about 300 seats it's the theater that opened i'm relying on memory 1868 or pretty close to that and verdi didn't like that theater he didn't love the busatani because they were judging him and his relationship oh. with giuseppina Strapponi. So he was not a fan of that place. But nonetheless, he lived in and near Busetto. And they opened this theater with Rigoletto, by the way. But years later, um, they would do productions. And uh, I saw Ricardo Muti conduct an amazing Falstaff there with Ambrogio Maestri's first Falstaff and Barbara Fritalia's Alice. And wow. then I saw the Saida because... I am friends with Fabio Mardiato and I was friends with his wife, Daniela de C. And um, this production, the triumphal scene had 32 people in it. Yeah. As opposed to get the Met Zeffirelli might do an Aida with 200 or a car. That, that was the thing that most people were asking themselves. How are they possibly going to be able to do this triumphal scene? And it was fabulous. It was really it was genius idea because you know the Busetto theater is like the size of this room practically yeah it's no. 300 people in a tiny stage it's tiny so, and so yeah, yeah they just they they made it look like uh the parade is going on what where we can't see them mm -hmm. so just see like the the swords going by but people were just circling backstage yep. and then coming back out and, yep. you know across it's really smart but what's thing. it like to sing a huge role in a little theater. It happens to be Amneris, but maybe there right. are other you've done that are, you know, big, what Martina Royal calls big girls. Yeah. Well, okay. So first of all, it was like the very beginning of, I was like one year into my career, I guess. So I still was even new to everything. Um, and then to be working with Zaffirelli, doing a big girl role in Italy and really just not even knowing what to be afraid of. Um, 
So I approached it the way I would approach any role. Um, I listened to a lot of recordings and then what they had us do was we, it was almost treated like a, like a, like a young artist program in a way. Mm -hmm. So they had all of us go there because there were more than one singer for each part. And they had us all go there with the idea of all of us training. And then everyone wanted to obviously have the anniversary performance that was going to be on television and the DVD and everything. But um, there were other performances everyone was going to be able to perform. And we worked with Maestro Stefanelli and um, Bergonzi and Zafirelli. And we worked for like two months before we even mm -hmm. performed. So we were breaking down arias, breaking down uh, interpretation. And um, finally, we got to stage and it was terrifying. I, I have to say it was like the most amazing experience of one of the most amazing experiences of my career, but also one of the most terrifying because every day was like a new audition, essentially, you know, and then it was so early in the career just to suddenly be you know, doing these televised things. And and then we were getting interviewed on Italian television. We were like famous for a second. Mm -hmm. um, and then it was so well received that then Zeffirelli wanted to take it on the road. And so we toured all over Italy doing it. I, I, I did so many performances of this. Um, but then it came to the time where I had to make a decision if I can keep singing this. Hang on, I just have to text him. Okay. Um, I'm going to say in the meantime that you you just mentioned you studied with Carlo Bergonzi, the very great yes. tenor. Carlo Bergonzi was from the town of Busetto, and he had a hotel about a five-minute walk from the theater called yes. Idue Foscati with a That's very we good having. restaurant in there. Yeah. And I... I've published a lot of Italian cookbooks. And in my first cookbook from about 1986, one of the recipes is called Caramelle Verdi, which were folded pasta with green pasta dough from Carlo Bergonzi that he taught me to make in yeah. that restaurant. And he was a great cook. And he also um, was very famous for his breathing techniques and yeah. the way he taught breathing and the way he would sustain a line and very elegant singer and very particular did he talk with you at all about breath as regards a singer he with us I felt like he talked a lot about support um and up and over that was sort of his big thing um yeah. and I, for me I don't remember it so much with the breath support but I know he was working a lot more with Scott Piper the tenor mm -hmm. um sort of taking him under the tenor wing sort of thing so yep. to speak um but now i don't remember him discussing that as much with us he was from the part of emilia romagna where they have a very sibilant s yes. and i've had to learn unlearn making that sound but when you hear carlo on recording sing in aida and i'll try to make it more sibilant than i would ever do Say quel guerrier io fossi. It's as if the tongue say quel guerrier io fossi. Yes. Corelli does that to some degree, but mm -hmm. no one like Carlo Bergonzi. <laughs> yes. Pavarotti was also from there, but he was able to scale that back. Yes. But when you hear um, non sei tu in Ballo and Mascara, Bergonzi's S's are always unmistakable. Un unmistakably Busetano. Busetano. It's a very particular thing. And so I always tried to imagine, did Verdi have that S? I know. Th yeah. This is how I like to imagine him in rehearsals. With that there, I mean, you wanted to be Troianos. I wanted to be Giuseppe Verdi, who's my hero. Oh, yeah. uh, not necessarily my favorite composer, though right up there. But yeah. there's Hector and there's Rossini and there are a few others. But as a man, to me, Verdi was the greatest. And but I I would he was supposed to have had a high pitched voice. 
And but I don't know. I never thought really about what kind of accent he might have had, but it must have been. It would have been from that region. Lusitana, I mean, which is a yeah. very particular thing. It's a very so, strong accent. You also have sung Octavian. Yes. Rosen Cavalier, yes. which I think he's close to your heart. Yes. Talk about your Octavian, which I've not seen, unfortunately. I actually only performed it once, and I was supposed to perform it a second time at the Bayerische Staatsoper, but then I got, I just had, had my child, so I had to cancel. Um, oh, I love that role. I, it, it, well, I love the, I mean, the music in, in and of itself is just so, mm -hmm. and so theatrical. I mean, it's everything is written, the interpretation, yeah. um, and so youthful and so joyful and, and sensual. And uh, I, I, I love interpreting it. And it's so much fun to switch in and out of the different characters, you know, when you become the chambermaid and then you Marie go back. Yeah. 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 Um, and then just to be able to sing that music to coast over that orchestra is incredible. I think, um, yeah, I was telling you about how much I love the presentation of the rose scene. Mm -hmm. That moment is just is just magical. Walking out to that fanfare that's happening underneath is just the presentation of the rose. Yeah. Um incredible. listeners know that I often ask my guests to provide recommendations from the Adagio catalog that they can go listen to. Um and you pick wonderful ones. You picked the one that more people have picked than any other, which is Tosco Maria Callas. Um, but you picked also the final trio and the press or and or the presentation of the rose with Krista Ludwig as Octavian. Um Krista Ludwig was another one of those artists like Tatiana Troyanos yes. who could do everything. Yes, she's incredibly also well. very near to my heart. Tell uh, tell me why. Because her voice, it, it it's it's this trunk of sound, no matter how high or low she goes, and it's shimmering and it's it's thick without being heavy vibrato. Um, it's I I think it's all colors in one sound, mm -hmm. essentially. To me, that's how that's how I feel it. Um, and the musicality, attention to text. She's she's incredible with text um i just i love that sound i could listen to that all day long and she was charismatic on the stage without overacting yes more i don't so. want to say that Trianos overacted but Trianos came on full force yeah and in some of the same roles like um kundry like um octavian Krista Ludwig was a little more gracious, a little more fricka, a little yeah. more underplayed and not bad because of that. Right. But Krista Ludwig was also the most intensely practical artist I've ever worked with. <laughs> and she just found ways to solutions. And she occasionally would say things that were really politically incorrect. Let's put it that way. Really? Um, but she could be tough in a master class. I once was in a master class, not as a performer. I'm not a performer, but um, I was on the stage and helping. And mm -hmm. she was trying to teach a very nervous young artist how to breathe properly on the stage. And Krista would say, do you have a dog? Do you have a cat? Yes, Miss Ludwig. Well, which one do you have? I have a dog. Get down on the floor. Get down and be your dog. And this poor woman who was dressed nicely because she wanted to dress nicely for Crystal Ludwig, um, got down on the floor and said, breathe like a dog. <laughs> breathe, breathe like a dog. And until this woman lying there in the dust of that stage could breathe properly, Crystal Ludwig would not let her get up. <laughs> and it was kind of scary. But what yeah. Crystal Ludwig was saying was, you should not think about your breathing. Breathing, yes. your dog does not think about how he breathes. He breathes. And yes. you have to be like that. And until oh, yeah. you could be like that, I don't want to hear you sing. And it was scary. Not because yeah. she meant to be scary, but just because 
you know, it's like I was born in 1928 and I got through World War II and I got through all of this and we struggled in Berlin and I had to learn. And so you have to be practical and never mind what people say to you. This is what you have to do. And yeah. I mean, Krista breathed fantastically well. I was at her farewell, which was here at the Met as uh, Fricka, and, and she was given an award and so on. But um, to the very end, her breathing was remarkable. And she continued to do recitals and teaching and so on. And she, I mean, I'm going to tell another story that's it's very publicly known, so it's not anything I'm telling out of school. But um, at these same master classes, there was another young woman who stood up and she sang very nicely and she was pretty. She was nicely dressed, but Krista Ludwig said to her, um, I have to give you some advice. You are very pretty, but not pretty enough, which is just an awful thing to hear. And the audience wow. sort of shuffled in their place. And she said, and that is okay because you can play characters and you have a very good voice. But here is my advice. When you do a recital, the page turner either has to be a man or an ugly woman. Okay. And the reason was, Crystal Ludwig being ever practical, you want them to look at you, not at the page turner or the pianist. <laughs> right. And, you know, this, I, I'm not defending what she said, but she did it in the public place. And she was all about practicality. Yeah. In the career. Yeah. And one could, and she was not difficult to other colleagues, but she just always knew what she had to do. Yes. Yeah. This is why she was able to sustain those phrases for, for years. Yeah. For extended measure after measure after measure. She she watched out for herself, it seems. She certainly did. Have you seen, have you seen this? Uh, there's this video of her in rehearsal with um, Bernstein doing Das Lied von der Erde, the, mm -hmm. the, the second of the three lower voice uh, numbers. And it's the part with the horses when they come in and yeah. he wants to do this incredibly fast tempo. And it's, it's where it's really texty and it's super low in the voice. Mm -hmm. And it's hard enough to get out at a, at a slower tempo. And they were arguing and bickering over the tempo, and she was definitely yeah. not not putting up with it. No, um, she knew what worked for her. But again, I, I want to make this very clear because I was crazy about her. She was a fantastic performer, and she didn't do this to compromise other colleagues. She right. just did what worked best for her. Yeah, but it was never about making someone else look bad. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important to point that out because I think it raises an issue that we in opera, but in every profession deal with is that sometimes we're asked to do things with all good intention that is not the best for for us. Now, there are other times where we are asked to take a risk and try to find the comfort to take the risk to do something new or different. And perhaps better, perhaps it will open a door artistically. Um, and this is what happens in rehearsal. And there are some artists, I'm not going to name her, but there's an artist I dealt with a lot who really could not budge in any way from what she learned from her coach. And okay. she felt very threatened if asked to in any way diverge from that. Yeah. And because she didn't feel comfortable with it, she, what she had she was a beautiful woman with a gorgeous voice and sang beautifully, but was not good in rehearsal because she expected everybody else to adapt to her interpretation yeah. of her role rather than build a character that integrated into the performance. Yeah. Um, because opera is a collaborative art. It's not done alone. Absolutely. Even if it's a, even if you're alone with the orchestra on stage, you're with the orchestra, you're with the conductor. I mean, it's, it is absolutely collaborative. And I don't think that we can fully grow to our full potential if we're not willing to try new things. And yes, yeah, sometimes you try it, it's not going to work, toss it. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you try something new and you find a whole nother element to not just the role, but to your voice.
that maybe you carry over to other roles. Yeah. So that requires taking risks in particular in, um, in particular for the technique. Tell me more about that in terms of technique. Um, taking risks? Yeah. I think, um, yeah, I think we can't stay stagnant. We are human beings. We are constantly evolving and growing and changing, especially as women. We have many different phases of our lives. Um, so we can't rely on this one technique that we started out with in our 20s. We're going to constantly have to add new things and make adjustments. Um, we make discoveries. We go to new coaches. Uh, you know, we discover new things. And the only way you can do that is if you're willing to change, you're open to change. Mm -hmm. and accepting parts of you that you let go and new parts of you that you are now willing to expose even if you've never done it before so it means adapting your technique slightly over the years which can be scary yeah because coaches if you work with a coach you like give you tools and give you insights that you want to build on and keep and use and then maybe another coach comes along and says no that doesn't that's not quite right right and there's that. what did you say no i said there is that but then there's yeah. also something that you might have done with a coach years earlier that was needed in that time for what whatever reason say you needed more resonance more face resonance mm -hmm. now you have that and that's fine but now what it's caused is some kind of resistance somewhere else or some kind of tension somewhere else. So now you have to undo that. So you no longer need to be focused on that one technical element. So that's just one example, but you're constantly needing to evolve. And yes, and and I do think there is such thing as too many cooks in the kitchen in terms of coaches, but I don't think that means you can only have one coach. I think you can have several, but you want to make sure you have the right ears listening. Speaking of kitchen, you led me where I was going to next. You live in Rome. Yes, I do. And you've lived there for quite a while. You are an American abroad. Uh, yes, I've had many guests on, on my program through the years who have been Americans who lived in Europe, either because for professional reasons, for marriage reasons, for any number of reasons. And have thriving careers in Europe. We don't necessarily see you wonderful artists on this side as much as we'd like to. But um, Rome is obviously very particular. That doesn't even have to be mentioned. Um, Rome is the setting perhaps of more operas than any other city. Maybe Paris comes close. Um, Rome is gorgeous at every turn. The Romans are immensely theatrical just in everything they do they are very stylish they're very opinionated they have an accent that kind of is like brooklyn or new orleans or yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. east london it's just a very particular accent um but it's a it's the capital of the nation that gave birth to opera Opera mm -hmm. now being a UNESCO protected art form just very recently. And, but it is not necessarily the capital of opera in Italy. No. And, and never really, really has been. No. And it's, and it's not even, opera is really not that promoted in this city. Yeah. Which is really unfortunate. It's, I mean, I mean I'll, La Scala no. is very famous. Venice, Bologna, because of many people who studied in Bologna. Naples, because it was where Rossini, Donizetti, and Bellini all thrived. Um, Torino, Genova. There are all these wonderful theaters. Body, Palermo, uh, Catania, Sardinia, um, Cagliari, and so forth. Um, but Rome, Rome has the wonderful Accademia di Santa Cecilia. It has the Teatro dell'Opera, which is kind of near the train station in Santa Maria Maggiore. And it's a good theater. I've seen stuff there. I worked there once. 
Uh, they produce beautiful program books. Um, but it's not, I, I agree with you. They don't really promote opera in Rome and I've never quite understood why. It's, it's, we can't figure it out either. I mean, also too, there's so many operas that were premiered in theaters in the city of Rome too. I mean, and the, are now not even theaters anymore. They're like Gucci stores. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. But yeah, I, I don't have an answer for you on that. It's a, it's a pity. They're sitting on a gold mine. They are. And I know of other opera singers who live in Rome. Uh, Cecilia Bartley is from Rome, but she doesn't get to sing there very often. Um, it's a particular thing because the Academia di Santa Cecilia is a wonderful institution. Yeah, that's It's excellent. fabulous. So it's world-class musically, but it steals a lot of the thunder yeah. that would otherwise maybe happen in a main theater. It's in what's called, if I remember, Città della Musica, yeah. and it's a modern facility. It's very nice, but it, it doesn't look like the rest of Rome architecturally. Yeah. It doesn't it doesn't make you feel like you're in Rome. Really. No, you could be any you could be in Stuttgart. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's not really that breathtaking. So but nonetheless, um tell me about your Rome. Because it's a, I, I mean, it's a magnificent city, but everyone has their own Rome in a way. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I live right in the Trastevere region, so I'm right in the center. Um, we're right on the river, basically. Um, and I really feel, I remember it when I used to come home after being away on the road, this is before having a child and I was always traveling. And when I'd come back to Rome, it was always just, it robs your time because it's really la dolce vita. I mean, it really is. You set out in the morning with no plan and you end up doing amazing things. And it just sort of sweeps you through its streets. It sort of guides you. You don't really ever, um, it's it's very much uh, a free time kind of city when you can have it. And obviously when you're dealing with, you know, bureaucracy and post office and administration and stuff like that, yes, it can be very difficult and even trash sometimes. However, um, I think you have to decide when you love a city like Rome or like a city like Venice, you have to decide to fo to focus in on the good qualities of it and that's enough for me i mean mm -hmm. i i'm in love with this city it's it it's uh it's it breaks your heart every day kind of you know some of the sunsets when it's showing off and it's just it's it's alive yeah um I'm fine, but a number of years ago, I had sort of a false alarm about you know, a medical thing, and they just did the wrong test, and I'm fine. But when I was faced with this concept of what if this is it, and if I only had a few months left, where do you want to go? Rome was the first place I thought of, which surprised me because I love the city. It's not my favorite Italian city. Okay. That would be Bologna. But, okay. um, but nonetheless, I thought... If this is it, I have to get back to Rome. Yeah. It was such an odd feeling because you couldn't plan that. Yeah. And I just allowed myself to float free. And, and you know, I said, yes, definitely Bologna, but I have to get back to Rome. And it's and also the Romans that themselves. I mean, I love, I love the Roman society. Yeah. I love the sense of humor. There's a kind of a, cynical sense of humor that I really love mm -hmm. that people are so good at it. They're so fast. Like yeah. everyone always gets the last word in and the food and the, it's, it's the an amazing food is city. wonderful throughout Italy, but Roman food is very fattening compared to other oh, Roman. Well, no. there's so much cream and butter and, and pork fat and I'm not complaining. Yeah. <laughs> but, I don't I feel like it's not quite as bad as some other regions, but yeah, it, it there is definitely a lot of the, Quinta quarta. Yeah. In other words, the fifth quarter, which is to say organ meats and so on. Yeah. Uh, across the river from you is Testaccio, which has a famous old market. Yes. 
where you can get pasta dishes and so on made of parts of pigs and sheep and cattle that most people elsewhere don't eat. Yes, and I it, used to not eat it. And now yeah. I'm Roman. Payata. Yeah. yeah. So the famous Roman pasta dishes there is carbonara, amatriciana, cacio e pepe, e la, la gricia. Do you have a preference? I fluctuate back and forth between amatriciana and gricia, but I also really like carbonara, but it's it's heavy and depends on the time of year. Um, but I also really like tripa. I know it's not a pasta, but I, right. I like the way it's prepared and I I feel it in a pasta way. Tripa yeah. being tripe in Rome, it's often made with mint, which is mint delicious. Pepe. Yeah, and pecorino. So if you live in Trastevere, you live very close to the place where La Gricia was introduced to Rome. And I don't know if you know the story, but I do. Um, a trattoria opened on Vicolo del Mattonato number no. 4 in 1936 yeah. called Da Lucia. And, yes! Okay, so in the 1980s, I told you I published a cookbook and, and this recipe is in that book. Um, at that time, the only place in Rome that made La Gricia was Da Lucia. Okay. And the director, Vittoria De Sica, loved going there, and he ate there all the time. Um, I was living in Rome a lot in the 80s, and I worked there, and I wandered into uh, Da Lucia and tasted La Gricia, and because I wanted to know what was what this was, for listeners, they should know that it is basically olive oil, um, a little bit of guanciale, which is pork cheek, um, pepper, no cream, no butter, none of that, um, and pecorino cheese on spaghetti or other pasta. And it came from a valley called La Gricia. And it was a food of the shepherds of that valley. That right. valley is basically now suburban Rome. But Lucia came to Rome in 1936 and opened a trattoria and made the dish that she called La Gricia because it was from her valley. Mm. It was not seen anywhere else in Rome. In 1989, she had died, but her daughter made it and her grandson made it. And they taught me to make it. And I wrote an article in the New York Times about La Gricia and its history and published the recipe in English. Somehow, even in this pre-internet era, it bounced back to Rome and suddenly, from my recipe, began appearing in restaurants all over Rome. Because oh. before, there had just been three, Carbonara, uh, Amatriciana, and Cacio e Pepe. And suddenly, there were four. But most yeah. people don't know the true story of it began in one place, in wow. Trastevere. And they still make it there. Yeah, have you... So, when was the last time you went to Lucia? Uh, nine. Uh, 2019 okay yeah yeah we used to go there a lot it's that was our favorite place yeah and they made delicious rabbit with white vinegar very roman mm -hmm. dishes they made an excellent rabbit yeah they made an ex excellent oxtail yes coda yeah. la vaccinata so coda la vaccinata for listeners is oxtail but the flavoring is celery yes and in the middle they put celery and it's a wonderful yeah interesting contrast because it's not a dramatic flavor but nonetheless works perfectly for that so um rome <laughs> now i really want to come right back to rome yeah um, i'm I always homesick if i'm away i was just away for one week for a concert and yeah. i get homesick to come back yeah i can't wait i understand that completely um I would like at some point, if I can, to have your husband on this program, but I know that one of the one of the pieces that you mentioned um, is Mozart's 40th Symphony mm -hmm. that he conducts. Why Mozart's 40th? Not that it requires any defense because it's glorious, but I mean, I I chose that because I he just conducted it with the Berlin Phil this past fall, and I was there, and it was his debut with them, so it was a it was a big moment, and. I just love the way he conducts that piece and that each instrument pops out 
and it really feels like a bunch of soloists layered upon each other. Um, this like water boiling over on the stove essentially. But um, no, I think it's just, I, it's an excellent piece and it, I hear so much of him in it. Mm. What does that mean? That's a nice thing to say. He has this sort of furious quality with his music making. It's it's all it's everything or nothing. It's just so it's you know this one hundred and ten percent, one hundred and twenty percent. It's always it's always extra, which is thrilling. I think um, one of the reasons, among many, that I happen to love the Forty Symphony of Mozart's Forty One Symphony. So I love them all, but this one in a particular way. It's because Mozart. Um, who died in 1791 discovered the clarinet because it was a, a clarinetist named Johann Stadler and the clarinet was not technically a new instrument, but the latest version of the clarinet was new in 1790. And he composed a lot of music for Stadler and had begun um, composing the 40th symphony with a lot more oboe. And he just sort of took the oboe out and replaced it with a clarinet. And it's the first symphony that really has a clarinet protagonist. And he then, Mozart, then used it to write the clarinet concerto and the music for Sesto and La Clemenza di Tito, exactly. which is mm -hmm. all clarinet. So yeah. the first roots of hearing Mozart's infatuation with the clarinet are in the 40th symphony. Yeah. And, and you can hear it. Yeah. And it's a wonderful, wonderful work. Um, did I leave anything out that I should have asked you? I don't know. I mean, I mean we did bar into food, and I could go into food for hours. Well, if you want to, we can. I just want to make sure that I covered stuff because, as listeners know, we've never you and I've never spoken, so therefore, I know. Um, it's been a pleasure, and I don't want to terminate it if there's something else to add. I do commend um, listeners to hear. Christa Ludwig and Fritz Wunderlich, Das Lied von der Erde, Rachmaninoff's Second Piano Concerto, uh, Vladimir Ashkenazi and Bernard Heitink, Tosca with Maria Callas, the um, Rosen Cavalier, Christa Ludwig, Elizabeth Schwarzkopf, Herbert von Karajan, and Mozart's 40th Symphony, conducted by Ricardo Minazzi. So, Kate Aldrich, anything else I should ask you? <laughs> Um, I think we've covered a lot of material. We did. I, uh, I'm curious about your your roots in your time in Rome, but um, I guess you're just. Uh, not... I went there for the very first time in 1973 when I was 17. Mm -hmm. um, Italy was always an object of fascination for me. I was to be a Venetian history major in college. Mm -hmm. Um, because Venice was not the birthplace of opera, but where opera bloomed. And so therefore I felt I needed to know about Venice. But when you study Venetian history or any Italian history, you have to go back to Rome. So Rome became the fascination. I lived in Rome again in 1975, 76. I lived on Via del Tempio number four. Um mm -hmm. I was a student in Rome. And then uh, a few years later, I worked there again at the Summer Opera Festival. I broke my leg on July 1st, 1988 in Rome. So I spent a lot more time there than I would have wanted to. Um, but it's just been a part of my life yeah. and a source of inspiration. And as I said, again, not my favorite Italian city, but so fascinating and you know, you turn a corner and you've gone from 400 AD to 1937. Right. And you turn another corner and you're in 1564. Um, I'm have been working for years on a biography of Michelangelo, who lived in Rome for much of his life. And I've walked Rome exploring the Rome of Michelangelo. And for example, found where his house was. Oh. Um, in, in Italy, they destroy a lot of things. You would have thought they would have kept Michelangelo's house. Yeah. They did not, allegedly, but it turns out they kept the facade. And they moved the facade a bit out of the city, and it's in a park. And yeah. I only discovered it by walking Rome that way. 
Uh, my favorite film, absolutely, is Fellini's La Dolce Vita. Oh, I love that. I got to work a lot with Fellini and Giulietta Messina. And they lived near Via del Babuino. Suddenly, Via, um, you know the street well. It's it's parallel to Via del Babuino. It, del Corso? A, hmm? Del Corso, Margutta? No, Margutta, yes. And they lived, I believe, it was number 155 near that very fancy hotel that's there now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I spent a great deal of time with the Fellinis. And I taught a course in New York at the New School about Fellini and his work. And and um, so in many, many ways, my life has been integrated into Rome yeah. in terms of fascination professionally, although not so much for opera. Right. Apart from 1988, when I broke my leg and I was working on a production at Caracalla. <laughs> right. But, but is um, that where your food fascination began? No, my food fascination began basically as soon as I could eat. Right. And I've always been a good cook. And so I've written many Italian cookbooks and guides to Italian culinary history. And um, it's fascinating unto itself. Mm -hmm. uh, the town of Anz towns of Anzio and Nettuno nearby Rome, south of Rome. I... I like to wander streets and use what's called the Plotkin nose. Yeah. And specifically in Netuno, I smell garlic in a new way. And I, this is quite a few years ago now in the nineties, I knocked on the door and, and, you know, at that time there was not the sense of threat that if a person was knocking on your door that he wanted food. But I asked the woman, what are you doing with garlic? Tell me how you're handling the garlic. And I explained to her that I'm an American, I work in opera, but I'm interested in food. And she had me come in and showed me how she peeled and sliced her garlic so that the flavor would infuse into the oil without burning. Wow. And basically, in, in, parallel to my opera life, I've spent decades wandering around Italy, talking mostly to very old women mm -hmm. and learning what they know. Because yeah. women who I met, in the 70s, sorry, may have been born in the 1890s and grew up in agricultural settings yeah. um, and learned the food that was made in the 19th century. Um, yeah. Pellegrino Artusi, along with Verdi uh, and a couple of other figures in the 19th century, uh, Alessandro Manzoni, created the Italy we know, musically, politically, gastronomically, and Artusi would go around central Italy, um, knocking on women's doors and asking, Signora, what are you making? And I, I decided that it was very important in the 70s and 80s and 90s to document what was the last generation of pre-industrial cooking. Interesting. So Friuli, Venezia, Giulia in the Northeast, Liguria, I wrote a whole book about in terms of the foods of Liguria, Sardinia. But I've done the whole country. Uh -huh. And, you know, rather than do trendy foods and, you know, the, the new in ingredient like sun-dried tomatoes, I would rather find out why, you know, in the case of Friuli Venezia Julian, you're a Mainer. They had blueberries there and why blueberries were important in the cuisine of Friuli Venezia Julia, but not necessarily all of Italy. Right. But why they were used for medicinal purposes, why in Freely Venezia Giulia you harvested herbs on the 24th of June. They yeah. were considered at their peak that day. Why you would, um, why wine is not wine until the 16th of November, the day of right. San Martino, non è vino fino a San Martino. All of this embedded knowledge that Italians didn't know or took for granted or never vetted because they were from their own town. Mm -hmm. And the Italians have what's called campanilismo. In other words, you're near the, your church tower and, and your point of reference, like Verdi and um, Bergonzi and Busetto. Verdi mm -hmm. was the man of the world, but Busetto is a rather provincial place with great food. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, someone say in Puglia <coughs> grows up eating a particular bread. To her, that's bread. Whereas if you go to Liguria and you have focaccia, 
or Tuscany and have sciacciata, a lot of them are very similar, but they're not the same thing. And the preparations are just enough different that they have their own histories. Yeah. And did you, have you ever spent any time in Le Marche? Oh, yes. Yeah. I lived there for the first seven years of my career. Where did you live? I lived in this very small, you know, this campanilismo. I lived in this really small town called San Paolo di Yezi. Mm -hmm. It's outside of Yezi. Yep. You know, there where we brought our olives to the press and right. where we got wine from my ex partner at the time's um, cousin's winery down mm -hmm. the street. We bring the empty bottles, they fill them, and, you know, we really lived the country life there. So for listeners, a wine, a, a, so an oil press is called a frantoio, <laughs> from the word frangere, to press, to compress. And you would, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the <laughs> um, the so-called extra virgin cold pressing first pressing would be that, because olives are fruit, they're not vegetables. Mm -hmm. And it, it, olive oil is fruit juice, mm -hmm. in effect. But then they would use the pulp that would be left for cooking for other things. Um, nothing goes to waste. Yeah. And the market is a wonderful region. It's where Rossini is from, Franco Corelli, um, Porto Recanati. I'm suddenly forgetting the famous tenor from there. But um, Leopardi, the poet, is from there. There's mm -hmm. a wonderful festival I've worked at several times in Macerata. Yeah. where they have an outdoor um, Sveti Stadio. Uh, there's the fantastic Rossini Festival in Pesaro, where I worked in the very first festival in 84 on the Viaggio Rems. And thing there, did, you, did you see that performance? I worked on it. The performance that I did? Oh, your performance. Pesaro, yes. When? I did, no, I, that I did not <laughs> I see. I did Salmira. Do you remember Salmira with Juan Diego Flores? Yes, I did not say Vesi Saputo, as the Italians say. <laughs> <laughs> I unfortunately did not see that. But it's a wonderful place because they can serve all of Rossini's scholarship and documents, and yeah. they make the case for Rossini in ways that we shouldn't have to. He was a genius, yeah. but nonetheless, we have to all the time. Yeah. So you and I have just become advocates even more for visiting all parts of Italy. Yes. It is, the, to me, the most inspiring country in the world, oh, by yeah. far. Um, and I, you know, as Michelangelo said when he was 82, ancora imparo, I'm still learning. And to me, I, I coined the phrase, I think, that Italy is the compliant muse. In other words, if you're open to learning, Italy is open to teaching you. Oh, yes, Absolutely. And I always encourage people to go beyond the obvious, although the obvious is wonderful, whether it is, you know, Michelangelo's David, whether it's um, the shopping districts of Rome, whether it's the Grand Canal, whether it's all the stuff, Capri, you name it, which are fantastic. But even the simplest things, if you if you activate your senses in Italy and, you know, you smell that garlic in Natuno, or you see the way a window is arranged in a shop in a little town in, in Piemonte. Everything is done artfully. Mm -hmm. And the sense of aesthetic and perspective and color and light is built into the Italian way of viewing the world. It's an and, incredibly cultured civilization. Yeah, it is. And, but with appreciation for the good life as well. Yeah, so it's not yeah. just about... You know, I think there's there's a healthy dose of hedonism and oh and yeah, and yeah, it's it's living, it's extracting as much out of life as you can. I think. Yeah, I coined a term. I think I coined it: pleasure activism. In other words, activating your senses, not necessarily be hedonistic in a in a mindless way, right? But to really savor and appreciate. You know, to, really listen rather than just hear and mm -hmm. smell yeah. and touch and taste rather than just be near it and yes. try to connect your senses to everything going on around you. 
-hmm. And you feel, I feel at least, very alive in Italy because it offers that. Other countries would, many countries would, if you activate your senses. But in Italy, it's the place where it can happen the most, I believe. Yeah. So, and Maine. And Maine. Maine is I know, I have a very dear friend who is a Mainer who has had a home in rural Tuscany for at least 50 years. Her former husband was the um, Rome bureau chief, I believe, for Newsweek. It could have been time. I believe it was Newsweek. Um, and she's a journalist and a food scholar. And her daughter is a wonderful chef. And she winters in Tuscany and summers in Maine. Oh. Yeah. Do, oh, yeah. Okay. Interesting. In Camden, Maine. Oh, in Camden. Yeah, that's up the yeah. coast. Yeah. Do you know, speaking of food, I can't believe we didn't get into this. My I grew up in a restaurant in Maine. My father, mm -hmm. father and my grandfather owned a restaurant in our little town on the river of seafood restaurant. I can imagine the, the river of fish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what would be a, a typical dish that they would prepare? Um, the, I think it was, this was the eighties. So there was mm -hmm. a lot of like, beef, like Newburg types of things like, yeah, lobster, sure. um, lots of lobster dishes, uh, baked stuffed or, um, steamed, but it was traditional mm -hmm. seafood, American seafood restaurant. Yeah. But it was Which good. Is pretty wonderful. North Atlantic fish and seafood is kind of wonderful. Yeah. yeah. No, it's great. The and Mediterranean so is great. The Adriatic is great. But give me the North Atlantic. It's because it's they're deep sea fish. Oh, yeah. It's magnificent. Yeah. And so we would, we grew up, um, you know, we ate there multiple times a week because my mom would just send us over. Mm -hmm. in so do you cook main food in Rome? Can you do that? I can. I don't. That's not really my thing. I tend to cook. Um, I love cooking, by the way. This is something else we have in common. Um, I cook a lot of Italian, but I also cook a lot of Indian food as well, which I really uh, like. Ah, uh, My the second spices. favorite cuisine. The yep. spices. Plain I love it. Spices. And the love subtleties. It. And um, so I think I do sort of like a, a mixture. Mm hmm. Sort of international slash Italian slash yeah. Indian. Yeah. Well, I look forward to sharing a table with you. Yes, point. we have to it's do really that. It's really been a pleasure and an honor to meet you and get to know you because I love your work. And, mm -hmm. you know, most people in our profession I in some way have spoken to, but you're one of the exceptions. So that yeah. I really want to do this. I'm glad you made it happen. And, yeah, me too. Uh, do you, I forget to ask, you have a website where people can find what you're doing? Yes, it's um, katealdrichmezzo.com. K-A-T-E-A-L-D-R-I-C-H-M-E-Z-Z-O punto C-O-M dot com. Kate Aldrich, thank you so much. And thank and you so much. I look forward to hearing you again soon, and then we'll cook. We'll Perfect. go have La Grecia. Awesome. Sounds Very great. Very good. Ciao. Ciao. Take care.